that won't happen again. Okay, uh, I'm Bruce Webster. This is CS428, Real World Software Engineering. Why this course? Uh, because of this. <laughs> and sadly, I apologize, we have teeny tiny screens here. Again, some of my classes have large screens. You can see waterfall versus agile versus how software is really done. Uh, the <laughs> five, yes, five phases of software development. Denial, anger, despair, so on and so forth. Uh, job interview, some of you have been through this already. You know, the, the interview, invert this binary tree, the actual job, make this button bigger. Uh, technical debt. Can you guys see these? I do, I do apologize for the crappy stuff in here, okay? Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, and finally, uh, I will come back to this. This is the visibility problem. One would not try to move into the house on the right, but management thinks it's just fine. It's got doors, it's got windows, it's got a roof. Why can't we start living there now? So, my slides are. Okay, goals for the class. First, why do projects fail? And why do they succeed? They fail more often than they succeed, or they limp along more often than they actually succeed. And we're going to talk about that at length in this class. Uh, you're going to do group projects, and as such, get real world experience. I actually had this conversation with a student at the end of uh, last semester who talked about his frustration at the lack of work that uh, other members of his team had put in, I said, welcome to the real world. Uh, but the idea here is to expose you by having you do a software project with people you don't know under unrealistic time pressures. Guess what? <laughs> that is the real world. Uh, understand the sociological and interpersonal nature of software development. Software de management keeps trying to treat software development like it's uh, manufacturing. It's not. It's a cross between making a movie and research. <laughs> you have lots of moving parts, you have lots of stuff that you don't know ahead of time what is going to work. Learning to deal with a dynamic, changing, and inherently ambiguous work environment, that is software development in a nutshell. Learning to manage orders of ignorance, which we'll talk about later today, is a professional life school, and helping you to decide whether or not you should accept that job offer. How many of you already have job offers that you've accepted? How many of you are currently interviewing? How many of you haven't started interviewing yet? Uh, there you go. Well, hopefully this will help you along the way. Now, how the class runs. We have a class website. Uh, where it's got the syllabus, it's got all the online readings, it's got, got all the podcasts that we'll talk about, it's got links to everything. It has a class calendar so that you can look there. Besides Learning Suite, you can look on the class website and figure out what you're supposed to be doing each and every week. Uh, do we have a project? We have a wiki that where all the projects will be managed from. If you have not already, and most of you have not, because I've only added, I think, about 12 people so far, I need, as soon as possible, your GitHub ID, your user ID. Just DM me on Slack. I will add you to the wiki, which will then send you a message back. And uh, uh, that's where we're, you're going to propose your projects this week, and I'll talk to you in a minute while we're on a real short time frame for this semester, and uh, where you'll, you will post all of your deliverables as a team. All assignments, everything else are, well, with, with a couple of exceptions, with your, your deliverables, which is to say your project deliverables and your 
status reports will all be posted on your project's wiki page. Everything else you do will be done via learning suite. That's where you'll, where you'll click off all of your reading assignments. Uh, it's where the midterm will be. Yeah, this is a very learning suite intensive class. Class is here in this classroom. Attendance counts as 8%, meaning you lose up to 8%. And you, if you miss class, what you can do is let me know that you either did watch it via Zoom, and I do have Zoom attendance turned on, so I can track it there. Or you can go back and watch the video, which I will post on the class website, typically a day or two after class itself. <clears throat> uh, TA, Michael Bronson, one of my students from last semester. Michael, introduce yourself. Hi, Michael. Maybe you can see me without my mask. Uh, we'll have contact information for Michael, uh, do office hours via Slack, via Zoom, call, you can see him in person. I saw him heard back from Gordon to see where, what cubicle you have, but I'll, I'll, I'll post that on there, but we'll have his contact information on the class website. Any, we're going to talk about all these in more detail, but any questions at this point from a high level? Any of you want to drop the class at this point? My average class GPA was, was I think, 3.6 something last semester. So again, just do the work. Uh, OK, we have some special issues this semester. The first is for the first time I've been teaching this class since January 2017. This is the first time that the Martin Luther King holiday comes on the third week instead of the second week. So we have class this week, we have class next week. We have no class two weeks from today, and since we only meet on Mondays, there's no class for the whole week. This forces us to get the projects moving very quickly. I'd like to get it done by the end of the class, next class period if possible. Second, there, there is a real, me, there's a real COVID upsurge. Like I said, I, I've had close to half a dozen posts that uh, have said, you know, I'm not feeling well, or I'm going out of town, or whatever. Uh, because of that, I'm Zooming this. I will try to Zoom all the classes. Well, I will Zoom all the classes. Hopefully, it will actually work. I hope you people on Zoom can hear me this time. Uh, <laughs> I've added, they're just seeing the screen, and they're not hearing anything. Uh, now, on top of all that, one of the things I do is I act as an expert witness in litigation that involves computer technology. I have one of the biggest cases I've been on in many years. Uh, it's over a $2 billion project. It's a trade secret case. And it goes to trial in federal court in Dallas at basically the first, roughly the first two weeks of February. I'm still unclear on the actual dates. Lawyers want me there for the whole trial plus a week ahead of time. So, I may, depending on what my time demands on there, I may simply conduct the classes live via Zoom, which means you can just, you know, hook up via, you don't have to come to class, just hook up via Zoom. Right now, the rest of the semester is already scheduled on Learning Suite in the online tab with Zoom sessions for every class. If by any chance I cannot conduct the class live, I will simply point you at the corresponding lecture from last semester and say, go watch this and let me know when you've watched this. Uh, so, any questions on any, I apologize for that. This is actually the first time in five years of teaching when I've, I've basically may have to miss class because of the trial. Uh, but there you go. Yes? How do we record attendance? I will take attendance. <laughs> in other words, I usually pause at some point during the class and I literally call roll. Okay. Helps me to get you to know your names, though, you know, I don't know, hold up much of especially with all of you wearing masks. Uh, but, there we go. Okay, any other questions on this stuff? Okay, grading overview. Attendance counts for 8%. Uh, basically, you lose two points, two percentage points for every class you miss and you don't make up. 
Readings will be 25%. Well, it's all up there. Okay. <laughs> now, you'll notice something that says extra credit up to 10%. 8% for additional book readings, 1% for additional web articles. I discovered last semester, let me ask this question. How many of you have ever watched the movie The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai? Well, yeah, that's pretty much the same answer I have. You can earn 1% extra credit by watching the movie. <laughs> it's out there on Learning Suite. Watch the movie. If you already watched it, just check it off. Get 1% right off the bat. This, 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 is, this is one of the ultimate geek uh, cult movies. And I was, I, was appalled, I was stunned at how few people had actually watched it. Uh, okay, reading, 25%. 15% for the three books you'll read. Mythical Man Month. Tableware, facts, and fallacies. Online readings are 10%. Uh, and all of the online readings are literally on the website. You can just click and get the PDF or it'll take you to a web page with the readings. Most of these are really short. Uh, especially all the Webster readings are typically like one to 2,000 words. And they're all these are either articles I've written over the years and have had published, or they're just dump blog posts I've done on different issues. Uh, these readings will be essential for midterm. One of the changes, and, and by the way, I listen to my students. Uh, and, and something that I've had students suggest a couple times, I used to have, you just checked off and did the reading. And the student said, can you do something to help us prepare more for the midterm? And so now, when you go to check off a reading, it will ask you questions that are just like the questions on the midterms. Now, I don't actually grade these. Basically, you can, you can take blah, 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 and you get full credit. But what this will do is prepare you for the midterm. And, and one of the things I discovered was that the midterm grades were even better last semester than I think any semester I've taught. Because by the time this, because they had already been looking at questions like this. They had already been typing answers like this. And they got to midterms like, oh, yeah, I know this stuff. I know what citations I want. Uh, like I said, reading completions are logged. Some of you wanted to start early. Learning, learning Suite wouldn't allow me to have an open date any earlier than today. But you can read ahead as fast as you want. And if you're, if you're a reader, particularly since you've got a week off of no class, I would suggest get, get ahead in your reading and uh, check them off. Any questions here? Yes? Are those quizzes going to be re reviewable after we take them? So like if we type you mean, can you use them during the midterm? No, like can we use it as Oh, yeah, yeah, the midterm, they're, they're, they're reviewable, yes, and that's an important point. The questions for the readings are you can save and edit more later. So you can look at the question for mythical man, questions for mythical man month, go read it, come up with an answer, read it some more, come up with a different answer. However, once they're closed, you can't go back and look at them during the midterm, because midterm's open book, open note, and I'm sure I'd have lots of people just sort of doing copy and pasting to a certain extent. I, I can't make it that easy. Yeah. So will the midterm be like mostly free response or some multiple choice? Midterm, well, we'll talk about the midterm in a second. Why these three books? <laughs> because they're important. I reference these in my expert witness work. Uh, and, and the sad thing, the really truly tragic thing about our industry is that all the root causes of project failure have been well documented for 40 or 50 years. No one reads, and if they do read, they don't believe it applies to them. It is sad how predictable project failures are. Uh, about 40 to 50% of my cases as an expert witness are project failure lawsuits. You know, company hires a developer to come and you know, develop software or configure and install software or whatever. And when I'm the expert there, and it doesn't matter which side I'm there, but I say is give me the documents in chronological order, especially the emails and status reports, and I can tell you exactly when the project started to go wrong. Uh, 
it's the same factors over and over again. It's, it's tell you, professionally, it's depressing, quite frankly. Any questions here? I think these are available. I think they're, they're electronic copies that are available. There may be cheaper free copies electronic that are available. <coughs> video podcast. Chuck Knudsen, when he taught this, made a series of video podcasts on different topics. Again, there's a list of these on the readings and podcast page of the class website. There's about, I don't know, what, 15 of them? 20? Uh, you only have to watch five. <coughs> and you can pick whatever you want. Uh, my recommendation, and I think the questions are set up, uh, the Learning Suite questions are set up to ask you which podcast you watched, because I have students every semester who said, can you tell which podcast I watched for number three? Because I can't remember, and I don't want to watch the same one over again. Uh, so, yes, and also some of them are rather long, so you, you may want to actually look at them and figure out how long they are before you launch into it. Uh, first one of these is due two weeks from Saturday. And these are always due at midnight on Saturday. That's the deadline for most, most deliverables that you're going to have. Midterm, 25% of grade. There is no final in this class. There's only one test, midterm. It's a late midterm. You'll have this three weeks before the end of the semester because it takes you that long to get through all the readings. Open book, open note, open device. You'll have a 24-hour period, basically all day from just after midnight until 11.59 p.m. that night to do it. It is three hours timed. <coughs> and even after five years of teaching this, I don't know if that means if you start at 10 p.m., if it'll cut off at midnight or if it'll just do three hours beyond that. I think it'll let you do the full three hours, but my recommendation is don't start after 9 p.m. Uh, you have to get at least a 60% to pass a class, and I've, I've had maybe fingers in one hand how many people have actually failed the midterm, usually because they've either just dropped out of the class before then <laughs> and didn't take it. Uh, and this is an example question. You'll have five questions like this. They'll be real-world scenarios, and what you'll be asked to do is to Identify risks and, or, and, by the way, I also post all my slides online as well. So those will be, those will be posted later today. Uh, you can take pictures if you want, but they'll all be posted. Anyway, uh, so it's like one or two risk factors you see is three recommendations. You need at least one citation from your reading for each of your answers. And when we get closer to the midterm, I've got, I'll do a midterm review a couple times, show you what the scoring criteria is like. Basically, a one-sentence answer, you know, adding people to a late project makes it later, Brooks Law, Mythical Man Month, Chapter 2. That's a B answer. That'll get you four out of five points. If you want an A answer, I expect two or three sentences that, that actually show your understanding of the issue and how it applies. Any questions on this? Yes? How many questions? Five. Five questions. 25 points each, 125 points on the midterm, and that goes, boils down to 25% of your grade. This, by the way, grading this, and I, and I always, because I'm lazy, I always delay grading it, but it's always the most satisfying part of teaching this class. Because I read through these answers, and it's like, yes, you are ready to send out into the world. <laughs> And, and here's the thing, which you'll hear me say and again and again, and believe me with this. When you finish this class, you will understand more about IT project success and failure than at least 90% of the people you work with out there. There's a reason why multi-billion dollar projects still fail on a regular basis. No one believes this stuff. Or they're not willing to follow it, or they think it somehow doesn't apply to them. And I do get, on a regular basis, emails back from former students who say, it's true, all of it. <laughs> Everything you said is true. And by the way, I'm leaving my current job because of that. Any more, any more questions on the midterm? Okay, group projects. 
And this is going to be a bit accelerated. Normally, we don't pick, we don't finalize the group projects until week three. Week three, there is no week three class here. And if we wait till week four, you're really going to be behind the eight ball. So we're going to try and get all the group projects set up by end of class next week. We'll have a little time to, for, there's always some last minute horse trading and people deciding, ah, I really want to go here and do this. But we're going to try and get it by next week. Okay. <clears throat> what I need you to do, and, and time is critical. Don't, don't goof off on this. Go out, log in to GitHub. Well, first it means this is why you need to get me your GitHub ID, user ID, as soon as possible. And I think only about 12 of you have done that so far. You need to go out there. There are instructions there. You create a page for your proposed project. You link to it on the main class wiki page. And I'll show you in a minute what that looks like. Uh, and I need what we do voting. I'm, I'm actually almost inclined to do all the voting in class. Because usually what we do is we have people vote. And then we screen out the ones that didn't get any votes. Uh, I'm, I'm <clears throat> uh, let's go ahead and do voting. See, see how much voting we can get done by next class. Uh, projects, we want about four to six people on a project. Part of what I, I have discovered in teaching this, I used to allow like projects up till nine. When we have seven, eight, or nine people on a project, communication is tough. And there are people with nothing to do. So I'd like to keep it focused. I'd want to keep it small. Uh, four to six people on a project. Basically, what you'll do is you'll produce software, lifecycle, deliverables for your project. You'll actually produce code. And three demos. This is another change I've made based on student feedback. It used to be I just had two demos. One three weeks before the end of the semester. And the second one, the final one, the last day of class. And the complaint I had gotten for a couple of semesters running is that people weren't really, team members weren't really buckling down because they kept saying, oh yeah, that's like a month away. We're fine. Okay. Now we're going to have three demos. Prototype, work in progress, and final. And they are each three weeks apart. So six weeks before the end of the semester, each team will have to show a prototype demo. You're going to have to have something on the screen. And this is done specifically to get you coding as soon as possible, which is a bad practice in most circumstances. But in this case, I need to really put the pressure on you. And then you'll do a work in progress demo three after, weeks after that. And then three weeks after that, last day of class, you will do your final demo. Uh, there'll be weekly status reports from each project uh, with hours that each of you put in on your project. And feel free in all this, all the wikis from all the prior semesters are out there in GitHub. Now, once you go to this one, all you have to do is navigate up to CS422 TAs and you can see all the repositories. Feel free to steal ideas, document formats, deliverable formats, everything else from there. That's the best kind of reuse. Uh, any question, I mean, we'll, we'll talk more about this, but any question on this right now? Okay. Part of what you'll have to do is each team will have to, sub to create each week a separate status report. I want a new one separately linked to and accessible on each one. I've, I've done this. This is something I introduced a couple of years ago because I want you focusing. Oh, Ta -da. laser point. Uh, and this is, this is all discussed, by the way, on the website. And we will discuss it in more detail in a class period or two. The key thing here is, and we'll talk about how bad these percentages are, but is to say, here's our tasks that we're trying to do. The idea is, here's what we accomplished last week. 
here's what we thought we were going to accomplish but didn't, and here's what we're going to do this week. Here are our risks, here are our issues, and over here is all your team members, their role or task, and the number of hours they spent that week on it. Uh, and as I said, we'll talk about this in more detail, but as an expert witness, I find these are a great indicator of actual progress because if I see two status reports in a row that look pretty much the same or haven't been updated or have the same, they didn't bother to update the date, I know that things are not moving at all on that project. Any questions on this? Yes? Is there a rough expectation of how many billable hours we should have each week? You know, that's hard. Yes, that's a good question. Frankly, once you get to the, and, and, and this, is, this is one of the reasons why I've, I've put in the, 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 the early prototype demo, is because it's real easy in the first month not to do much of anything. Uh, my expectation is on the order of five hours. Uh, if it's less than five hours, that's sort of a warning signal for me. Uh, but, you know, it's, these aren't going to be due until First one is going to be due till the end of the month. Yes? Okay, related question. Are those hours tied to our grade? Or is it whether or not we reported hours, yes or no? Uh, it, what it is, and I, I, talk, I think I talk about this on the next slide. Uh, well, let me see if the, the next slide here. There we go. Michael, the TA, you, each team will have a designated project manager. Michael, the TA, each Monday will review your status reports and will have a chat, DM, Slack, phone, in person, whatever, whatever works best, with how it's going. Uh, he may also talk to other team members to see. And the key issue is to ensure all team members are actively participating and contributing to the project. And I personally receive the right to reserve the right to adjust grades if you're not doing anything. Uh, it is a course, and, and I, I think I first heard this from my daughter when she was getting her, had a senior project, year-long senior project, uh, while getting her BSCS at the, at the U, said, I've decided, and she was, she was cribbing this from somewhere else, she's decided that when I die, I want the members of my senior project be my pallbearers so they can let me down one last time. <laughs> uh, don't let your team members down. Contribute. If you're having a hard time figuring out what to do, talk to the rest of the team. Don't go silent. Don't hide out. Talk and contribute. This is another reason why I don't want the teams more than about six people. Because when you get above that, it is pretty easy to hide out and it's hard for the team to figure out who is or is not contributing here. Other questions? Yes? To be sure, like to be clear, does that mean that our participation is just yes or no based on whether the team and the TA feels like we're contributing? Yeah, if, if there's a okay. genuine if there's a genuine issue, either I or the TA will sit down with that person and or the project manager and or even to other team members to figure out what's happened. That's, I've only really had that happen a few times in the five years of teaching this, where I really had to have a, sort of a come to Jesus meeting with one of the team members and say, hey, look, you know, this, your grade's on the line here. Uh, start doing something. Thank you. But no, there is no, there, there actually is no grade that's specifically tied to the number of hours that you've put in. Okay, team project deliverables. This is what you're gonna do as a team and here are the deadlines. Uh, I want to see a wiki set up for each project, which will simply be, hopefully I'll all do project proposals this week, next week we'll winnow that down. We have, what, 43, 44 students here, uh, so we're looking at uh, about seven or eight projects probably. We'll, so we'll have it winnowed down to seven or eight projects, and you'll simply use your proposal wiki as your project wiki and then what you'll do and then you've got a two-week gap to really get a jump in and start figuring out what you're doing how you're going to do it 
On starting on the 29th and successive weeks, you'll do an org chart with role descriptions, requirements, curtain and gap for your schedule, architecture and design, test plan and specification. Notice that the prototype is due ap right after you've done all six of these. So you need to be working on actual code, doing prototyping all along. Uh, that's on the 28th, the work in progress is three weeks later on the 21st, and the final demo is three weeks after that on the 11th of April, which is the last day of class. And those will all be done right here in class. You will plug the HDMI cable into a device, whatever your device is you're demoing on, so make sure that you've got an HDMI adapter. Uh, any questions on this right now? And again, we'll talk. We'll talk more. We'll talk a lot more about this next week, quite frankly. You have two individual project deliverables, and that these are deliverables that the, the, the this schedule. There's one copy of each of these for the team. They're all post all posted on the wiki or the demos in class, and everyone gets the same grade. And frankly, I mean, I'll, I'll be quite honest. If you turn something in, your, your team gets full credit. Unless it's just so atrociously bad that, you know, and, and, and even then we'll come back and say, okay, can you flesh this out? Yes? So how will we design them on the team? Do we have, like, someone who'll pose the project? Or will we just have them do the one you want to attend? Yeah, what we're going to do is I want all of you to propose, and I, I, I say all of you, and I know it's only going to be about a third of you, but. <laughs> I want all of you to propose projects out on the wiki. You simply create a new page, and I'll, I'll go, go through what that looks like in just a second. Create a new page, you add it to the list on the main wiki page, uh, and then what, what I want to accomplish next week, since we won't have class a week after that, is we will vote in class, and what I'll ask, for example, is, okay, <clears throat> Of all the projects, we'll go through all the projects and we'll say, okay, now of all these projects, you get three votes for the three you're most interested in. And I'll tally those votes. And then if, if projects that are below a certain threshold will basically get blocked off, said, okay, the remaining ones, you've got two votes. Now, which two are you most interested in? We'll go through that and do the same screening out and actually some often sort of resurrect at this point. Uh, and then we'll, we'll come up with a list and say, okay, of all these, you have one vote. What's the one project you most want to work on? And that will form our final set of projects based on votes. Now, if we end up with projects with more than six people, then part of the issue is, okay, you can do two separate projects that are doing exactly the same thing. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's, that's much better than having a project that has too many people on it. It's actually more entertaining to see what the two teams come up with. So that's, that's, a, that's where you'll have the chance to actually vote on which projects you want to be on. And there's always a bit of horse trading. And of course, even after we settle that, we have people come back and say, you know, I really want to go work on this one. I said, okay, you know, talk to the team you're on and the team you're going to and make sure they're both fine with that. If they're fine, I'm fine. And so on, yes. So do these projects need to be from scratch, or could it be like an, an existing open source project that we want to like add features to or something? You, you can do that. We've, 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 had, we've had projects that have been actually third outside commercial efforts that got brought in because we had, I had like three or four people from that company who were doing it. They said, hey, we're doing this. Uh, so yeah, you can, you can bring in, propose whatever you want. The, the trick is, can you entice enough people to do it? That's, that's a deciding factor, but no, it can be existing. Any more questions on this? So we'll, talk, we'll, we'll have lectures on all of these deliverables and everything else. Yes? Are we allowed to propose more than one project? Oh, yeah, project? yeah. If you've got several ideas, feel free. Because I said only about a third of you are going to propose projects anyway. <laughs> uh, two individual project deliverables, both of which you check off on Learning Suite. One is by the 21st. And I actually may change that to the 28th. Uh, you have to conduct a code review of source code from one of the other team members uh, and sit down and talk. And that's just a yes, I did this. And then the last one 
And this is on Learning Suite is a project in class postmortem. Uh, it's due by the last day of the semester. It's on Learning Suite and simply what what you know what did you learn from your project? What went well, what didn't go well, what did you like about the class? What would you suggest to improve the class? And I read these. This is where I get a lot of I, I have continually continued to tweak the class over the last five years based on the feedback I get from the students. Uh, okay, common class project pitfalls. <laughs> Let's talk about these right up front. Using a new or unfamiliar technology or language from the project. I have students most semesters say, you know, I've always wanted to learn Swift. Let's do a project with Swift. Does anyone here know Swift? Great, we're going to learn it and do this project. And what happens, you spend eight weeks trying to come up to a certain minimal level of competency in Swift and never get anything done. Uh, the, and, and this is something we'll actually talk about a lot in class because this is where a lot of projects fail. It's, it's kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, we're going to do this mission critical project using this new language that no one's ever used before here in a project because the CTO thinks it's really cool. It's the way we should go. Uh, not agreeing and early on the technology base. I've, I've seen projects that have been really, they spend weeks trying to debate, oh, should we use this? Should we do that? Should we do this? Guys are going to have to focus. And you've got a two week. Hopefully, all the project teams will be assigned by next week. And you'll have a two week period before we meet again. And in those two weeks, you should make all these decisions. And just live with them. Guys, it's a semester class. It's not a time for religious wars over languages, methodologies, frameworks, OSs, yes. or anything. It's a semester class. Uh, being overly ambitious in your scope. Uh, I had, OK, I'll say it for the first time here, and you're going to hear me say this in almost every class. The only way to manage your schedule is to drop features. Can't do it by working longer hours. There's no magic silver bullet that's going to solve it for you. The only way to do it is to drop features. If you're overly ambitious, you will drop a lot of features. I actually had one team last semester who were relatively modest in their scope, and by the time they got to their first their first demo, which would be your second demo, they said, oh yeah, we did everything we, we set out to do, so we're adding new features. So that's the way to do it. Start out stupid and work up from there. Bruce Henderson, good friend and colleague. Uh, so you don't want to be over individual team members failing to contribute. Not looking for ways to distribute. Boy, this is this is so hard. You all have other classes. How many of you have other programming classes besides this one this semester? Yeah, look at that. It's all it's basically close to 100%. <coughs> uh, you have to look for ways to distribute the workload, which means you have to not say, that's not my job. You have to find ways to break up what you're trying to do into small enough chunks so that you can parcel it out and then hold people accountable. Not keeping all team members in I suggest private Slack channels or Discord or whatever you want to do, a private channel for all of your team members and you communicate regularly in that. You've all got, how many of you are carrying at least 15 hours a semester? How many of you are carrying at least 12? Yeah, there you go. It's going to be hard to keep in touch as team members. Make sure you have set up the channel. Uh, getting a slow start. This is, this is why I had <laughs> the third demo. It's like, no, no, I want a demo six weeks before the semester ends. I want to see if something working on a screen. Uh, this is me keeping your feet to the fire. Any questions on any of these? Okay, opportunities for extra credit. We already talked about that. Uh, <coughs> if, if you really, <laughs> there are books. There's a list of approved, pre-approved books. Uh, on the class website, you can read any of them and just tell me you read them, bam, two points. Uh, if you have a book that you want to read and it's not on the list, just DM me. 
Uh, if I consider it in any way related to software development, software engineering, I'll say, yeah, sure. Uh, there are some extra readings which used to be part of the required reading, uh, and I, I screen those out just to keep stuff focused. So you can pick up a point there, and you can pick up a point by watching the adventures of Buckaroo Bonsai across the convention. Any questions here? Okay. <coughs> I'm going to give just a brief introduction of myself because I'm going to be telling stories about my career for the next 12 weeks or whatever. Uh, some of you may be tired of hearing about me by the time this is all done. I graduated with my uh, bachelor's degree from BYU in 1978. Uh, went to work for General Dynamics, worked at General Dynamics, worked on space shuttle flight simulators and SGSC, worked next door at the Lunar Planetary Institute, did embedded systems at Monitor Labs, and then a friend from high school who had success doing word processing utilities for PCs said, hey, I've always wanted to do games. Want to do a computer game? Uh, and I'd actually been doing writing about uh, computers and, and gaming for some time and had been doing some game design. So I joined Oasis Systems and did, uh, Wayne and I did Sundog Frozen Legacy for the Apple II. Later ported the Atari ST. There's a lengthy Wikipedia article about it, and I still get fan mail. It's probably my single proudest accomplishment. Actually, there are times I look back at what we did with Sundog, it's like, whoa, that was aggressive. I mean, I literally wrote the graphics library from scratch. This is on an Apple II 6502, right, right down to the bits, did all the memory management. Uh, we hacked the operating system. Uh, I wrote, I wrote it a it was written in Apple Pascal in assembly language. Apple Pascal is UCSD Pascal, which compiles P code. It's a byte code, much like Java uses. And I actually wrote a, a 6502 assembly slash P code disassembler. We disassembled the whole operating system so we could do stuff to it. Uh, I, estimated, I, I estimated roughly that in terms of tools I wrote for making the game, represented about three times the number of lines of code of the actual game itself. So it was great fun. Uh, but I burned out on software engineering, uh, went to start writing for Byte Magazine, moved back to Utah, uh, that was in 85, and when my former professors found out I'd moved back, they said, we'd love to have you come teach for us. And I was very flattered, because I just had a bachelor's degree. The reason why is because in the eight years since I had graduated, or seven years since I had graduated, Enrollment had gone from 120 to over 1,000. It was one of the great peaks, and this was nationwide. It was one of the great peaks in CS enrollment. Uh, so I taught here for a couple of years, continued writing, uh, moved out to uh, Silicon Valley area, did more writing, did some contract work, uh, got back into software development, <coughs> did a second startup doing an object-oriented, design-oriented desktop publishing system called Pages. Uh, did it for the Next Step operating system, which, like I tell people, seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, sadly, there was no, there wasn't sufficient installed base there, and by the time we ran for our venture funding, uh, no one wanted to give us money to port over Windows. Uh, and then I started into consulting. Uh, both in software architecture and in project management. And you'll hear me talk a lot about this. Uh, and then in 99, I got hired out of the blue by Pricewaterhouse to do expert witness work because of some of the uh, teaching and stuff I had done. And uh, that lasted two years. And then we had the recession of 2001 and Pricewaterhouse said, oh, guess what? We're, we're cutting way back. But here, here's a bunch of cases. You can take these. And I, 20, or in 2001, basically set up my own company and been doing that for the last 20 years, been doing expert witness work, uh, project, and software consulting. And then, as I mentioned, uh, having moved back here eight years ago, uh, once Chuck retired, the department said, you know, would you like to teach us? And I taught it. And the, uh, uh, they've been very kind. I've been very grateful. They, they're happy to have me. They've already asked me if I can teach fall and winter in the coming year or so. 
I think they keep expecting me to keel over and die at some point, but <laughs> so far I've disappointed those who are waiting for that. Uh, because this has taken so long, all I'm going to cover for the rest of the day is just the first few chapters of Mythical Man Month. Uh, we'll cover armor and uh, the heuristics stuff next week as well as more of the Mythical Man Month. My goal in lecturing is not to do the reading for you. My goal is, is that you do the reading and that you come to class prepared to ask questions about the reading. And since you really haven't had a chance to do almost any reading, <laughs> uh, the, uh, we'll, we'll just cover these few chapters, which, which are good chapters. And uh, then I'll let you go for the week, and uh, we will reconvene next week. OK. System for a new family of IBM mainframes, the uh, 360 family, which, by the way, is the first computer I ever programmed on uh, here at BYU. Uh, <clears throat> it was a late project, it was a troubled project, and as a result of that and his other experience, he wrote the Mythical Man Month. All the way back in 1975, so we're coming up on 50 years, Brooks has a very light very terse writing style. You'll find his stuff to be a very quick read. But he tucks a lot away in there. Now I've been, for 25 years I've been writing, consulting, lecturing on issues and problems in software engineering. There have been a number of times during those 25 years when I think I've come up with a brand new insight. And I've gone back and looked through Man, Mythical Man Month and I've found it's there. Uh, this really is a seminal work in software engineering. You may be put off because a lot of the technological references are archaic, but that just shows how timeless and universal all the sociological and project issues are. The <clears throat> I testified before Congress three times on IT issues. First time I testified was talking about the the risk in government remediation of Y2K and the need to focus intensely on it. And said this, <clears throat> and that last sentence said, you know, Brooks explored the root causes over 20 years ago, this is in 1998, in Mythical Man Month, a classic book that could be regarded as the Bible of information technology because it's universally known, often quoted, only occasionally read, and rarely heeded. Uh, and this is so true. I had an experience, my first consulting experience, uh, <clears throat> which I'll, I'll talk more at length about, but one of the things I asked was that the head of this division, I said, can I buy copies of Mythical Man Month for everyone? He said, sure. So I bought 30 copies and handed them out all the way from the division head through all the layers of management, all the developers, and about six weeks later, went around and found no one had, had read any of it. <laughs> and yet it detailed exactly the problems they were facing on very different levels. I mean, this, this is what it's like out in industry. Uh, so, one of the things Brooks talks about right off the bat, This was also a student's suggestion. I kept gesturing wildly towards the screen. I said, you get a laser pointer? It's like, oh, yeah, duh. Thank you, Amazon. Yeah, you know, like three days later. How many of you program for yourself or for your own amusement? You know, pretty much all of us have at some point. How many of you have worked on a program that's intended for others to use and or to be released commercially? What's the difference between those two? What are some of the differences you encounter? Anyone? Any? Yeah. You, if you're working for your like a personal thing, you do not care about 
how it looks the same way. Like, because you know you're the only one that's touching it. Yeah. And, you know, if there's some goofy thing that's a euism, you're like, I can leave this in here. This is because no one else has to worry about it. Or in, in my case, I've, I've developed tools to do source code analysis and so on, and I change them wildly on the fly, and usually don't preserve the, the older versions, because all I care about are the results. Oh, yes. I was just going to say something similar, that personal projects I really care about text it on, where yeah. it's like, if it's in the industry, that's a pretty significant insight. Brooke says that there's about a three-fold difference in effort between these. I think it's actually a lot more. <laughs> It's, but that there's a whole lot more you have to do if you're going from a personal project or a small in-house project to something that's actually a product that others are going to use. Uh, programming system, operating system, uh, a framework, stuff like that. How many have worked on something like this? Like a development environment, framework, set of libraries. What's that like versus just writing a program to do something. What are, what are the differences you see? Um, you have to care a lot more about like dependencies and how things interact and work together beyond just like does it work or not. And then this last corner is a programming systems product. This is a commercial OS release. Uh, commercial, uh, I, I would argue commercial compilers. I did a number of manuals for Borland software back when they did Turbo Pascal, Turbo C, and so on. Because A, I could write fast, and B, I was a programmer. So I understood what I was writing. And Philippe Kahn, who was the founder of Borland, once said, he said, never, never go into commercial development products. He said, your customers are least forgiving. Uh, and that's true. How many of you have actually experienced a, a honest goodness bug in a compiler? I have. Yeah, it's a betrayal. It's like, what? <laughs> how, how can you have an honest goodness bug in the compiler? I have to trust that this will actually compile the workable code. that will do what I want. <clears throat> what else adds to software complexity? What are some of the things that you found that make software difficult? Yes? It's hard to predict the future. It's hard to predict the future. You mean in terms of what the requirements are going to be? Or? Yeah how the market's going to change. What else makes software difficult or complex? Oh, come on, we all program. What makes it hard? Yeah. I would say unclear requirements. Oh, yes, unclear requirements. Ever-shifting requirements. Ever-expanding requirements. The infamous scope creep. What else? Yes? It's hard to account for edge cases, like maybe input that you weren't expecting and use cases that you weren't anticipating. Oh yes, oh yes. That's that's and that's that's what's deadly. And it's, we will talk at length about quality assurance uh, and about how everyone skimps on quality assurance when it's the thing they should be most focused on. Uh, what are some things that can make software difficult to maintain or update? Yes, person paying the bills doesn't want to maintain it. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, I just saw a question on Quora. Someone asked this outright question, said, the one developer who knows this system and no one else knows how to do it has just accepted a job elsewhere, and this is going to sink our company. Can he leave? And he and everyone else, I mean, I and everyone else who answered said, oh yeah, <laughs> you can. This is the truck factor. Uh, how, many, how many of your developers can get hit by a truck and you can still function? Uh, <laughs> And, and it's a very real issue. The last thing you want in an environment is someone who's irreplaceable. Everyone has to be replaceable because you don't know what's going to happen. <clears throat> what else can make this difficult? I, I could, well, yeah, go ahead. Poor documentation. Poor documentation. Uh, documentation for the language, for the environment, for the library, for the operating system. Uh, or worse yet, wrong documentation. It says, here's the expected result when this happens, and you find out it's actually something quite different. Uh, I had this just this morning. I'm, I'm actually, besides teaching, besides being an expert witness, I'm actually part of a uh, software development team uh, that's helping to, I, I'm newly brought on, so I, and we'll talk about Brooks Law and how it applies to me. Uh, 
but the software is older software that's being repurposed to track and log COVID testing. It was originally designed just as regular vaccination software. And there was a discussion just this morning uh, in a sprint meeting how the software is built on Ruby 6.0 and Ruby 6.0 there are some differences between Ruby 6.0 and Ruby 6.1, and there are significant differences. They're trying to figure out when they can actually update the software, because right now it's, it's handling literally like a million tests every couple of weeks. But they're trying to figure out at what point it's going to be safe to say, okay, we really need to move over to 6.1 because we have these lingering issues with 6.0 that we're going to continue to have until we move over. So you have dependencies upon the operating system, upon the language definition, upon particular tools, and software tends to entrench itself. Now, you're all seniors. I assume you're still here because you actually find some enjoyment in the program. Uh, if not, it might be good, you know, you've got, who's going to med school? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm doing this, but I'm going to med school. Uh, the <clears throat> Another question, I, I hang out on Quora. Uh, and uh, there's, there's a question that just came up recently. Someone said, does anyone out there, says, I, I, I'm, I'm a software developer, does anyone out there actually enjoy programming? And I thought, heck yeah. I wouldn't have gone through four years of my CS degree if I didn't enjoy programming. Uh, there is this fascination. I've, I've always loved this quote from Brooks that software is only slightly removed from pure thought stuff. We are, it is like magic incantations. If you know the right language, if you know the right words, if you have the right elements and tools, you can make miraculous things appear on your computer screen. You can control systems at a distance. Projects I've worked on, and, and this is, you know, I don't consider myself anything special. I've worked on the space shuttle flight simulators. I've worked on embedded devices to monitor emissions and smokestacks. I wrote a computer game. Uh, wrote, wrote was, was chief architect for a word processor. Uh, there are few things more satisfying than actually seeing your software run. And actually what's more satisfying is when you have other people who really like your software. Again, it's been almost 30 years. It'd be 1984 is when we shipped Sundog Pro's legacy to the Apple II. And I still get fan email from it. Uh, and that's, that's very gratifying. Uh, it's kind of like, yeah, I have something that people 30 years later still remember. Uh, what are some of the things you like about programming? What is what, what is kept you in the program as long as that changing majors? What do you like about it? Anyone? Anyone? Always learning. Always, always learning. Yes, <laughs> Troy. That's that's my standard warning. If you're going into IT. You're going to be learning for the rest of your life. I literally bought seven or eight books off of Amazon because of this new project I'm on. Talking about Ruby, talking about Docker, talking about AWS. <laughs> Basically all the technologies that are in the system. It's like, yeah, I guess what I get to come up to speed on. Uh, and as an expert witness, trust me, I have stuff that's way out there. I mean, I've, I've had, I had one case, it was a patent case that involved the devices that inject uh, fluids in you prior to a CAT scan. And it was all written in, I'm trying to remember what the processor was. It wasn't a processor I was familiar with, like H11 assembly code. Addressing hardware addresses for reading and writing data, and for controlling the device. And I had to figure out what the software did. Uh, and it's always sort of at the start, it's like, oh my gosh, I've got to learn all this stuff. And you just sort of chew on it bite by bite. And at the end, it's like, hey, yeah, I know this stuff. I can talk intelligently about this. Uh, you get to learn the rest of your life. What else? What else do you like about this? Yes? I like um, when I have a question or a problem, 
that can be solved with computer science, I can just go and solve it. Like if I'm like, oh, I have this data science question, I can go and you know, run the science and answer it. There you go. Yes. So I kind of like working with my hands and making things. And in any other situation where you're making things like welding or woodworking, the materials and the tools are prohibitively, prohibitively expensive. But with computer software, it's all free. You can write as much code as you want, and that doesn't cost any money. You have, like with, with cloud services, you have almost unlimited access to really cheap infrastructure, too. So just like the, the accessibility is really cool. This is how I ended up in computer science, by the way. My uh, major my freshman year was microbiology. Uh, I took Chem 105, 106. Uh, and did great on the test, but was just a little sloppy and careless in the labs. Uh, tended to leap to conclusions, oh, I know what it is. Uh, and then you, if it was wrong, you would have to start all over and go ask the professor, yeah, I need another sample of the stuff we're analyzing and so on and so forth. And one of the reasons I switched to computer science is kind of like, yeah, I could just delete the code. <laughs> I could just change what I have. I could save multiple copies and figure out which one works. So yes, it is that, uh, that intractable nature. Uh, any other reasons why I think people enjoy software engineering or what you do? Yes? The community. Like Stanford, community. Great Stanford community. Stanford. It is. Uh, I've, I've, I've been, I call myself a geek in a suit. I, I've been a proud member of the IT community for almost 50 years, creeping towards that. Uh, keeps me on my toes, keeps me learning new things, uh, and it means that I understand the infrastructure of human civilization better than most people. <laughs> because everything runs on software. Everything. That's something I've, I've seen in my lifetime, is the transition of human civilization to be utterly, utterly dependent upon software. Uh, to an extent that, that, that is fascinating and occasionally frightening. OK, what are the problems with programming? What do you like least about it? Yes? Android Studio. And recently, yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd say the, the I was I just exchanged a comment with someone who talked about their work on the Motorola 68000 processor system, and I said, "That's my favorite processor of all time. Had a wonderful, straight, uh, clear addressing model, orthogonal." And the one that became popular were the Intel x86, which I just think are atrocious. Uh, anyway, what else? What else don't you like about software engineering? Security. Huh? Security, like cybersecurity. Oh, cybersecurity. Yeah. Products. Oh God, it's just it's it's leaking all over the place. It's a bit scary. Uh, what else? Bugs. Huh? Bugs. <laughs> Bugs. And one of the things that. Uh, this is, this is an important point that we're going to go into more with uh, Brooks. Debugging has at best linear convergence. You think, you think, oh, I'm fixing bugs, and it's going to wrap up quickly. No, what happens is that you get sort of this logarithmic. It takes twice as long to fix each successive bug. Uh, and the reason why is the easy bugs are the ones that you fix quickly. And you get the, it becomes harder and harder bugs harder to reproduce, harder to figure out what's going on. Uh, and we don't spend enough time on quality assurance up front, which I will talk about when we talk about test plans. Yes? Stack Overflow posts that say, never mind, I fixed the problem, but don't tell you how. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is that. Oh, yeah, I found a pro. Oh, yeah. I've been here. Yes? Very common documentation or other written literature things that are explained in a way that's so complex that you can never actually understand what it's trying to say. There's a famous saying, uh, I'm old enough to have, I'm old enough to have bought a Mac, Macintosh the month they were released, February of 84. Uh, and the programming manuals for them is called Inside Macintosh. I, I have a set. Uh, and the standard joke that came out when Inside Inside Mac was divided up into 26 sections talking about different portions of the, the BIOS and everything else you can program on. And the standing joke was Inside Macintosh consists 
of 26 sections, each of which requires you to understand the other 25 first. Uh, and that wasn't far from the truth. It was very hard. In fact, one of probably my proudest technical writing achievement was that Turbo Borland came out with Turbo Pascal for the Macintosh, and I wrote the manual. And I actually have a chunk of the manual there that taught people to using Turbo Pascal for the Mac to write a Macintosh application without them having to access inside Macintosh. Uh, that's probably one of the greatest simplifications in saying, okay, I did all this work for you so that I can explain this to you in a step-by-step -step process and you can do this. Uh, so yeah, a lot of, lot of documents. I have, I have thick manuals for Inside Mac, for Next Step, for Intelligent. Uh, what else don't you like about programming? What are, what are some of the painful portions? Yes? I think something I, I personally struggle with is like the nature of programming. Like on my computer, like all the things that distract me are also on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yes, and that's, a, that's actually a relatively new. I mean, I, when I started programming, of course, like when I started, I was using key punch card, you know, key punch terminals and decks of cards. But even when I got to a terminal, the only thing I had to distract me was either programming or playing Star Trek on the Dex System 10. Uh, the, uh, but yes, we have, we have so much, we have such vast amounts of programming, uh, or excuse me, such vast amounts of, what's the word I'm looking for? Consumer or consumptive systems, you know. We've got streaming services, you've got social media, you've got email, you've got everything else. They can be very distracted. I'm gonna push ahead here just a little more because I'd like to get it, get you out of here by five. By the way, most classes will run an hour and a half. They're not gonna run two or two and a half hours. Uh, first couple classes are gonna be a bit longer. We'll have occasional classes that run a little longer. Generally, I aim to be over by 4.30. And you can use your remaining time for team meetings uh, to work on stuff and so on. The Mythical Man Month. <clears throat> Root causes of delay and failure. Brooks says our techniques of estimation are poorly developed. They're still poorly developed, 50 years later. Software estimation remains one of the most difficult and intractable problems. When you read Armour's The Five Orders of Ignorance, you'll understand better why. We'll talk about that next week. But the general problem is value in software comes from doing something new, something you haven't been done before, and when you start on that path, you don't know whether or not it can be done. Or whether or not it can be done within the constraints of time and budget that you have. This is where a lot of projects fail. They set out to do something, and they think they can do it, and then they discover along the way the things, that, and again, I, in our brain, he'll talk about things that you knew you didn't know, but you're gonna have to learn, which we all know, oh, yeah, I've just gotta figure out how to do this. But he says the real killer are the things that you didn't know that you didn't know. That you have to you have to know in order to accomplish this project. Those are the icebergs that will rip out your hull. Uh, our space station techniques confuse effort with progress. In other words, oh yeah, yeah, we just have to add a few more people on, or if we get a team of ten people, we can knock this right out. Whereas it's often irrelevant. Probably should stay over by the computer so they can hear me. <laughs> uh, it's it's often the number of people is irrelevant, or if anything, is damaging. Uh, we often lack the courage to say we don't know when it will be done. This is this is part of this is part of what you have to learn is to say no, I don't know how long it's going to take. And management hates to hear that. They hate it with passion. They want everything to be predictable. And with software, there is so much that is unpredictable. It is hard to tell how far along you are. This is a visibility problem. If you watch a house being built, you can walk by every day and say, oh yeah, yeah, they, it's clear. They, it's just bare walls. Or, you know, oh look, they're putting plumbing in, or they're putting wiring in, or they've got this. It's really hard to do that with software. It's really hard 
even when you know the software, even when you're working on it, to sit and look at it and say, yeah, yeah, I see how much is done, and we really only have to do this, this, and this, and we'll ship. <coughs> this is where that ignorance comes from. And when the schedule slips, the impulse is to add staff, which is like dousing a fire gasoline. <laughs> the software project I've talked about, I've been brought in on. But been brought in on basically because there's one key guy on the project who's just swamped. Uh, and it's me, this is through OSG that I've worked for for 25 years off and on. I was their CTO for three years and then Tony keeps bringing me back in on specific projects. But the biggest problem, I've been living Brooks Law firsthand. I'm trying to be productive and all my time is spent trying to come up to speed and it's causing others to have to spend time with me to bring me up to speed. So, so far, I've basically slowed things down. Uh, and it's, re it's a very visceral reminder of how true Brooks Law is. All programmers are optimists. Uh, as Adele Goldberg says, only optimists build complex systems. <laughs> because obviously no one else would even start. Uh, we often assume each task will only take as long as it ought to take. And we think everything is going to go perfectly. Uh, you know, the probability that a given task may be, may be successful is high, but there are hundreds of such tasks. <clears throat> and this is, this is something I will say again and again. It's very easy to lose a day on a project. It's almost impossible to make it up. And I'll add, if, if you lose enough days, the only way you can make it up is by dropping features. Plus, and that there'll be an article that you'll read by me that talks about this, we tend to defer the difficult problems. We pick all the low-hanging fruit. We do the prototype. We do this. We do the easy stuff. We get things to 80% complete. And then we find ourselves, and we say, hey, yeah, we're 80% done. We're 90% done. Uh, there's a saying which I didn't originate, I see other people quote it all the time, that the first 90% of a project takes 90% of the time, and the last 10% of the project takes the other 90% of the time. <laughs> uh, and that's so true, because all the difficult stuff's been deferred. And it's when you try to finish off everything else that projects start slipping. Plus, we think everything is a simple matter of programming. <laughs> uh, man month, yeah, I mean, you're going to read this, but the idea that adding people to a late project will help, no, it makes it later. You increase communication bandwidth, and it's going to take time for them to come up to speed, and they're going to make other people less productive. Uh, there's also an issue of personnel turnover. Uh, as per the, the question I mentioned from Cora, what happens when, how many of you worked on a project where someone who was really important to a particular part of the project held key information or really was the only one who understood the first piece of code left? Anyone been on that? Yeah. What happens when that happens? What? Panic. Panic, yes. You spend a lot of time trying to figure out your own. Oh yeah, you're kind of like I've got to figure out what's going on here. And of course, if it's not, if it's not clear code, it's not elegant code. If it's messy code, it can it can really be a disaster because you have the situation where you have pieces of code uh, that you can't touch. I saw someone talk about a piece of code <coughs> that uh, was was in a on a web page where they had like literally like 40 levels of nested tables. Uh, most of which were blank until you got down to the core thing. And this person said, I tried to very carefully delete layer by layer each of the layers of nested tables. And he said, when I got to a certain point, it always broke and I could never figure out why. And I finally had to put it back the way it was. I don't know why it worked as it was written, but I did know that if I tried to change it, it would, it would stop working. Uh, ta -ta. Uh, oh, testing is, this, this is something we're talking a lot about. First time I read Brooks saying you figure you're going to spend half your time in component and system test together. No one plans for half of a project schedule to be testing. 
But what I have learned in 25 years of reviewing failed or failing projects is that, yeah, this is pretty much true. The reason why these projects stretch out for years is because of lack of testing and lack of resources testing. I've got some stories I can tell about that, but I'll, I'll wait for that. There's the quote about the 90-90 rule. Uh, underestimation of system testing, integration and end performance stress, is usually deferred until right when you're getting ready to ship. And if you haven't been designing and testing for that all along, that's when you get the really unpleasant news that the system just isn't going to isn't going to do it. Any questions, comments on this? Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, let's let's wrap up. Uh, gutless estimation, yeah. <clears throat> you have to, and, and we'll talk about the thermocline of truth and stuff like that. Uh, let me just say, you have to be brave. You have to be willing to say, I don't know, or you have to be willing to say, yeah, I think that's actually going to take about twice as long as you're estimating. Management never wants to hear that. But it happens anyway. That's why we have so many project failures. Uh, and again, you have the problem, we're late, and people work longer hours, both of which tend to be counterproductive. The only real solution is to slip your deadline and or drop features. That's what works. Okay, okay, I finished at five. Uh, propose at least one group project. I want most people to propose projects. A lot of you say, I want to do a project I want. So go out there, write up a project, write a great pitch so people will read it and say, yeah, that's what I want to do. Because you're going to have to convince others to uh, come on. By next week, read Armour and Regston. There, there are links to PDFs on the class website under the readings tab. Uh, read chapters 1, 2, 4, and 5 of Mythical Landma and review the projects in class with you. You can feel free to vote for them there. Uh, otherwise, we'll just we'll do all the voting in the class. Any, <coughs> excuse me, any other questions, comments? Thank you. That's about as long as we're ever going to go. So. Uh, have a great week. Stay healthy. See you all next week.